This stream is sponsored by Asmodee Digital, the people behind the digital version of Gloomhaven, or rather the publisher behind um, the digital version of Gloomhaven. The actual developer is interesting. I was just reading about this. Um, the studio that's actually doing development is Flaming Fowl Studios, which are a studio that worked on like the Fable trilogy and the movies. Does everyone remember the movies? I freaking loved that that game. It was so sick. It was like it was sort of a tycoony management game about running a movie studio, but it actually had this like fully built-in ability to actually like make and record movies with actors and props and dialogue and things like that, and then you could export it. They had a site. This is a long time ago. This is a long time ago. But you could actually ex export your your movie to a site. And like show people your creation. So it was, yeah, it was all those things. Yeah, Lionheads and movies, yeah. You still have the CD. I uh, me too. I, I don't know if it runs anymore. I have no idea, but oh my god, it was a stupendously great game. Uh super good. We maybe you know what, Skaverat, you're probably right. We probably should see if we could play the movies, because I think it would be a hoot. Uh, let me know how the uh, the sounds are, if the music is too loud uh, from the game or not, and then we'll also readjust once we actually get into it and do the sound effects. Alright. Let's talk about Gloomhaven here. So Gloomhaven is a real life board game. Uh, in fact, it was originally Kickstarters and was, was very, very successful as a Kickstarter. Uh, sold out pretty quick. They did a second Kickstarter to fund a second um, a wave of, of printing of the game. And it also went really well. A very it, consistently one of the top rated games on Board Game Geek. Really, really solid. What is it? Gloomhaven is sort of a role-playing game, tactical combat kind of game. The easiest way I often describe it is something like something like Dungeons and, and Dragons, except you don't need a dungeon master. The real-life physical box set for Gloomhaven is fairly pricey. Um, it's it's you know somewhere around $100, $150 US or something like that for this board game, which seems insane. But first of all, two things: the box is legitimately monstrously huge, and it's packed with all just good stuff. I've talked about it before, one of my favorite games is actually um, Mansions of Madness is an excellent game. Uh, but I feel like, and it's 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 at a fairly high price point too because it comes with a lot of minis and stuff like that. But I don't know if the minis were really required. It's like, I think they could have gone for a cheaper version with less stuff. With Gloomhaven, there is nothing that can be cut from here. And again, it still seems like pricey for a board game, but here's the thing. What you get in it, you get a bunch of stuff, but it includes this booklet over here. This has 95 different scenarios in it. With my group, we can bang out about two of these in one evening, which means if we play every single week nonstop, it'll still take almost, almost exactly an entire year to play through the entire game of Gloomhaven. It has so much content, it's sick. And it's really great. It's a really fantastic tactical combat game with groovy mechanics and a lot of sort of, um, uh, development of the story and the mechanics as you go forward. It's sort of one of these legacy games where, because uh, some people on Twitter were worried about spoilers. By the way, there aren't, there, you don't have to be worried at all if you're playing the physical version of, of Gloomhaven. Today's stream will not spoil a single thing for you. Um, you can cut stuff if you use the app. Oh, like the, the time required? Yeah, I do use an app to manage the, uh, the monsters when we play the tabletop version. Um, so, the digital version of Gloomhaven is currently in early access, and the full campaign that's available in the physical version is not yet available. We're going to be running this Guildmaster mode, which is awesome, um, but won't spoil anything for the real campaign. So if you're worried about um, either you're going to be playing the digital version or you're going to be playing the physical version, you don't have to worry about any spoilers here because we're not going to be dabbling with that. But the way it works in the physical version, you get all these scenarios, you get the story stuff, all of the different scenarios expand the story, and basically there's... The scenario will tell you to like hook these types of board components together to make these maps. There's like tons and tons of these pieces. They all get locked together to make a bunch of different maps for each scenario. And then each player has their own character, which you keep in your own personal box. This is the character that I play in my physical Gloomhaven campaign. This is the Tinkerer. So each character, each player has their own custom box for their characters with their own character sheet with various stats and marks and development that happens in there. Uh, you've got your various ability cards and so on and so forth. You also get a sweet little box with your personal character model. And that's all great. Lovely. But you know what's not great? 
COVID-19. Because I haven't been able to play this in months now because, you know, can't can't really have my buddies over. And that's why I've been so pumped about the digital version of Gloomhaven. Um, it's going to be a lot more accessible for a lot of people. And it means that you can play if you can't get together physically, maybe because there's a giant pandemic, but also maybe because you've got friends that live in different towns and you'll be play, play able to play online. So Gloomhaven, the app is still going into under a ton of development. You can check the roadmaps on like the, um, the Steam page for this thing. It's got so much that it's done, regular updates, lots of great content, including the last big update has come out with cooperative multiplayer play now. So you can actually play multiplayer Gloomhaven the way it's meant to be played now with your friends. And uh, it is currently 32% off. I don't know why they picked 32%. Seems like kind of a strange number. I don't know if it's meaningful in some way, but it's currently 32% off for the next two days on Steam. If you do exclamation mark Gloomhaven or exclamation mark what game in the chat, you'll get a link that'll bring you to the Steam page if you want to go and check that out. Bum, 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 bum. Oh, that's a good point too, Splash. Mm -hmm, hmm. Um, sorry, I was doing a lot of talking without reading chat here. I'm very interested about Frosthaven. I don't think I knew about it uh, while the Kickstarter was open, unfortunately. Or maybe I did, but I think, yeah, no, now I remember. But we have so much left to do in Gloomhaven first. I'm like, I can't, I couldn't justify the Frosthaven stuff, even though I love the setting, I love the story and everything that was going on. Um, ba -ba -ba -ba. Oh, that's interesting, Cabana, Carcassonne. All right, so anyway, let's go ahead and get started and we'll talk about how this game goes. So we're going into Guildmaster mode. So with Guildmaster, you represent, the idea is basically you're sort of representing a guild of adventurers uh, and that's the vibe that's going on here. So we're gonna start a new adventure. Uh, we'll put on normal difficulty, seems fair. Um, and our guild, what are we gonna call our guild? The Lollipop Guild? No, the Petra Inc. Uh, the... S mighty sprouts what do we call ourselves the atomites <laughs> the quills the quillians the navigators guild the gloomy boys cat pet the brussels sprouters uh da -dun 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 -dun. the brussels sprouts the sassy sprouts quill and paper oh i kind of like that one those shaves good too I, I don't know i like the quill and paper guild it's kind of it's kind of awesome let's go ahead and do this now we are we're not going to do the full tutorial here full tutorial teaches you the basics of the actual game mechanics we'll start on story intro mode here um and what this is going to do it's going to yeah it'll introduce a story give us a little bit of you know um dialogue to read and introduce the heroes the characters that we can use sort of kind of one at a time because there's a lot of different playable characters in the big box the actual physical game I want to say there's 15 total characters, like wildly different classes, wildly different experiences. Um, but what's interesting is I think there's only six of them that are unlocked from the start. That's one of the big things with Gloomhaven. A lot of stuff only unlocks as you sort of progress through the campaign. Things are going to work a little bit differently in the Guildmaster mode, although once the campaign is in, it'll probably see something fairly um fairly similar so by going with story intro we're going to be sort of introduced to the characters kind of sort of one at a time here but i think it might be the best way to kind of introduce the characters and their mechanics we'll do that you can go to quick start at which point all of the uh, playable characters for the game master or the guild master mode uh, will be available and you can just craft your party at, at that but i think i think this will be a nice little medium between things mm -hmm. i was about to say i thought there were only four six characters yeah six at the start in, in the physical game. Um, the Tinkerer is one of the ones that is available at the start uh, as well. Anyway, story intro. Let's do this. Bum, 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 bum. All right, one of the things, uh, and this is true in the digital version or the physical one, is there's the, um, oh, I should have brought it out. There's sort of the world map. Well, sort of the area map. There's the actual town of Gloomhaven itself um, and then the surrounding areas. And what's cool is as you actually unlock things in the campaign, in the physical one, you're adding stickers onto the board to reveal new locations that you can go to. So we've got a similar thing going on here where we, we've, we don't have a lot revealed on the world currently. We've got the town of Demon's Gate and we've got a little place we're gonna check out where we hear there's some brute hanging out there. So we've got a trainer here. All right, work getting through the basic training missions. Well, we skipped it, but you know. Allow me to introduce you to the third member of the guild. He ain't much of a fighter, though. Hey, not all of us particularly care to be experts at stabbing people. Oh, uh, please excuse me. 
Uh, greetings, Guildmaster. I'm the humble merchant of your fledgling guild. I deal with the important aspect of running a guild. In other words, money. He's basically a Ferengi. Uh, if, I, if I could do a good, like, sort of Ferengi accent, I would totally use it for this guy. Um, which, might I add, is sorely lacking at the moment. Uh, what you can see right now is the world map. You probably noticed it looks a bit barren at the moment, and, well, I've got some good news and bad news for you. The bad news is the realm has been overrun with all manners of unpleasant monsters. I know, sounds like a good time to me. Rogue, bandits, wandering undead, dark cultists, you name it. The good news is that you're going to help us restore the routes back to the other settlements out there hidden in the fog. I'm going to move my face now because I'm hiding a dialogue. I think once I'm back in the game, I'm going to want to move it back, but we'll see how it goes. It's actually not bad for some of the deeper voice friend. Yeah, there you go. Thank you. Um, just do a naval voice and spout rules of acquisition. <laughs> Uh, the good news is you're going to help us restore the routes back to the other settlements out there hidden in the fog. Before we can do, before we can do anything about that, anyway, we'll, uh, we'll need, we'll need to get some mercenaries on the guild roster. Let's start with actually recruiting the poor old brute who's got himself in a spot of bother again. All right. So what we're going to do here is we're simply going to choose the mission we're going to go to. It's called I am brute. Uh, yet again, the brute, brute finds himself in a precarious situation, guide him out safely, and he'll surely join the guild. So we'll go there. And the reward for completing this will be to unlock the Brute character for us in this little guild, Guildmaster campaign. Yeah, two Brute. <laughs> you are the Brute Squad. Oh my god, people are dropping all the references today. You're the best. Uh, I am Brute. The trainer tells you to head to the Demon's Gate graveyard, and there you find a mausoleum with a smashed-in front door. The Brute, by the way, is an expert lock picker. You don't need a rogue in a party. You just bring the, root, the, 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 the Brute with you. Um, it's just that after he picks a lock, the door is no longer usable. Smash! Uh, walking down the steps into the gloom below, you follow a trail of broken bones until you hear the sounds of battle. Entering a chamber, the badly wounded brute is facing off against a number of undead. So we're going to enter the dungeon and load that up here. Kind of like how monks disarm traps. All right, let's begin looking more closely at each human digital character. In doing this scenario, the Brute has two level one living bone elites to deal with, which means their stats are greater than the level zero counterparts. Monster stats are combined with the base ability cards drawn during their turn, resulting in the cards you'll see. Listen, let me let me explain this to you. Look, they both have shield one. Gotcha, we can ignore the shield with pierce. Excellent. Um, and we also get a bit of a hint that these guys are going to do multi attacks, which means some shielding on our own would be a great idea. Um, our objective this round. So this is still sort of light tutorial light. Uh, in here. Um, or more to think about it, this is more like um, it's like a little puzzle um, to to quickly solve. Very very simple lay, um, a starting situation uh, with a solution to find here as part of sort of the intro extended tutorial. This is not well, this is what a normal mission looks like. It's not what a normal mission feels like, I would say. Alright. So let's take a look at the user interface. We have our character here, the Brute. I mean, Game looks gorgeous. By far the most beautiful adaptation of any board game I've seen, any digital adaptation in a board game. It's just stupendous with the visuals. At 10 out of 10. We've got the Brute himself. He's currently sitting at 1 HP left. He's in a little bit of trouble. And we've got these two skeleton elites in front of us. Uh, we've got one with 3 HP left and one with 6 over here. We can mouse over and see their basic stats. Um, the way the game works is your character... Let me, let me display with my physical copy of the game. Your character actually has a number of cards, and these cards represent the abilities that they can use in combat. And there's a kind of a fatigue system because after you kind of play these cards, they go in the discard pile, and there's a way to get stuff out of the discard pile and recycle them, but not all of them. At certain, some point, some of these abilities get burned and you, you can't get them back. Mostly. There's some special stuff, but mostly you don't get them back. And if you ever kind of run out of all your ability cards, your character's in exhausted, and that's it. They're out of the fight. So you can, you can, your character can get tapped out from hit points, but also from burning through all your cards. So managing your, your cards and your abilities uh, via rest and things like this is very, very, very important. In this start of this scenario, the Brute only has three cards currently available. Uh, his warding strength is in his discard pile. He's got two more that have been burned as well. So the cards available to us are Shield Bash, Spare Dagger, and Trample. Each one of these cards... Oh my god, the Skeletons do have three arms. Maybe because they're elites? I don't know. Huh. Each one of these cards has a top and a bottom. The way your turn works 
is you select two cards. You have to select exactly two cards and uh, you know, you, you set them aside in front of you and, and you're good, you're prepped for your turn. Then when your turn comes up, what you're gonna do is you're gonna use the top of one card and the bottom of another card. You don't have to commit to which one of those two you are going to use during the prep phase. During the prep phase, you just choose two cards. But then when it's your turn, you're gonna use the top of one card and the bottom of another. Typically, the top of a card is most usually an attack, um, and the bottom one is usually a movement or utility thing, but that's not always the case. The other thing to note is that you don't have to use the text of the top of the card by itself because you can use, um, you can, there's always a generic one. But let me explain what I'm talking about here. With Shield Bash, the top of Shield Bash attacks for four damage and stuns someone. The bottom of Shield Bash gives us one point of shield. However, as an alternative, I can use the bottom of Shield Bash, but only use it to do a move of two. I can just I can use the bottom of any card as a generic move two. I can use the top of any card as a generic two attack. That's not that's usually not the ideal because usually the actual card effects are more powerful. But there's going to be some flexibility there. All right, so we've been given a hint here of a couple of things. First of all, we need to make sure we kill one of these dudes. Probably the one with three hit points seems fair. The other thing is we only have one HP left. We know these guys are going to multi-attack. Now, what's great about the shield effect is it does actually reduce that much damage. So in this case, shield one would reduce one damage from every attack this round. So if we go and shield one on our turn, we will be able to resist a lot of damage. So that seems like a, a pretty obvious play. We're going to do that. Um, and then if so we're assuming we're going to play the bottom card, the bottom part of shield bash, and then we're looking for a card that we want to use the top part. Well, Spare Dagger hits for three, and it's a ranged attack. Got a range of one, which sounds pretty good. Um, and three is all we need to do to kill the skeleton, except he's got a point of shield. He's got a point of armor, basically. So this Spare Dagger is only going to do two damage. So it's not enough. Whereas the top of Trample hits for three and pierces for two. It ignores two points of shield. So we can kill someone with the top part of tramples. This seems great. The bottom part of shield bash, the top part of a trample. Um, spare dagger for bottom attack. It's spare dagger is interesting because it is, again, it's fairly unusual, but spare dagger has a bottom part that does let you attack. But we're going to use the bottom part of shield already. So we're looking for something we want to use on the top. Now, the other thing is, it's a little subtle here, but you see how this card has a 15 and this card has a 72, and if I click on those, one becomes glowing? This is actually what determines your initiative for the round. Lowest number goes first. So you're picking two cards, but you're going to be using that number on one of the two cards to determine what order you're going to move in combat. Um, and the monsters are also going to get an initiative number. We don't know what it's going to be but the monsters are gonna get one. So I'm gonna go and pick 15 for my initiative because I wanna go before the bad guys so I can get my shield up, if at all possible. So I'm gonna select these two cards, done. So the Living Bones have drawn their card, which is this. On their turn, they can move up to four uh, spaces and then they're going to attack for two. They have built in multi-attack. They actually, normally they can hit up to three different targets. Okay, that's their normal thing. They can hit up to three different targets, but they can only hit one target once. With the card they drew, they can attack one enemy with all their attacks. So each one of these is going to hit me three freaking times. That's why the shielding is gonna be so important. We got a little bit of a hint that this was probably coming. That's why they have three arms. Oh my God, that's why they have three arms. <laughs> oh man, you guys are smart. Okay, notice they're going on a 74. If I'd, uh, my other card that I picked, I think had a 75. If I'd picked that initiative, I'd go after the Living Bones and be dead. We're gonna go ahead and hit continue. So you can already see the actual core game mechanics are, are really simple. Take two cards, use the top of one and the bottom of another. But the implications of your choices are gargantuan. All right, so. Let's, first of all, before we, you know, we do anything, we're gonna go and use the bottom part of the card to shield. I could use the bottom part of the card to move by two, but I'm gonna use the bottom part of the card to shield. This symbol means it's gonna last until the end of the round. For, for the entire round, I will have a point of shield. I'll take one less point of damage from everything. So I'm gonna confirm that action. Lovely. Shields up. Mm -hmm. The co-op mode, uh, I, I, I haven't tested it. 
Uh, other people are playing it though. It sounds like it is working, which is fantastic. Um, and uh, I'm ready, my, uh, my, my normal board game group, who I still hang out with um, every Tuesday. In addition, now we do play by email like throughout the week. But every Tuesday we get together, uh, we are gonna be doing this. Um, but not yet because it just came out. I think that just, was it two days ago or yesterday? where the co-op mode was officially, officially released. So uh, I missed the window to actually try it out here. Okay, now we have to use our second card. We have to use the top part of the card. You can always use the top card part of a card for a two point generic attack, but there's no point in doing that here. So we're gonna use the trample here to attack for three with piercing of two. So I'm gonna select that. We have to choose a target. We had a nice little preview to show us how much damage we can expect. Now, normally, you're not necessarily going to do exactly the damage listed here because in in a normal, let's say we're playing Dungeons and Dragons, right? You'd normally be rolling for damage. There is a mechanic similar to that here in Gloomhaven. It's actually a stack of cards that you have. You have another little, little deck of cards that look like this. And then when you do an attack, you draw one and it tells you some extra stuff. For example, if I were to draw this one, woo, green screen. Um, I would do plus one damage. Also set things on fire and stuff, but you know, that's more advanced. We'll talk about that later. In this scenario, our deck only has zeros. So we will do exactly what our card does. No more, no less. So that, that's why it makes it a little bit more like a puzzle. So I'm gonna go ahead and attack this fella over here and I'm gonna confirm the target. Get an awesome animation. We kill one target, great. Before we end our turn, <coughs> excuse me, so that we don't die, we're going to consume our healing potion over here. Uh, we have a minor healing potion available. Uh, on our turn, we can use this to perform heal for three damage. So we're going to confirm that. And now we're up to four hit points. Okay, now our turn is over. We do have boots of striding. We can use it to add plus two movement. We don't need to do that. We do have a heater shield. When damaged by an attack, gain shield one for the attack. That's going to be very useful, I think. So the Living Bone Elite's gonna go. He's gonna sing swing three times. The first one, he actually got a plus one in his damage. Um, so his base damage is a two. He got a plus one, which brings it to three. I have one point of shield, so right now it's looking to take two damage. What's interesting is there are ways to avoid taking damage. I, I have a choice now. I can take the two damage, or you remember how I talked about how it's important to manage the cards in your hand uh, and stuff like that? As an alternative to taking damage, I can burn a card completely so it's going to be unavailable for the rest of the combat to negate all damage alternatively from the cards in my hand i could discard two think cards in your discard piles have way of, ways of coming back i could also discard two to avoid all damage here however i don't have enough cards to be able to justify doing that i will raise my heater shield so this is uh you can see there's a little kind of a, a tap icon on that to indicate that's used this is going to be used um it can come back things that are consumed like that uh can come back during a fight when you take a long rest but i'm gonna go ahead and use the heater shield now so i'm only gonna take one point of damage i'm down to three i can't take a whole lot more damage though we're gonna see all right skeleton's next attack he's only hitting us for one i don't i can't discard any cards otherwise i'm just gonna be fatigued and i'll be kicked out of battle so i'm gonna take the one now i have to hope he only hits me for one on his last attack Spoiler alert, it's, it's a puzzle with predetermined stuff, so that's exactly what happens. He's going to hit me for one point of damage. I'm going to be okay. Woo! All right, let's do that. Yikes, that was quite the onslaught. Nonetheless, your shield prevented enough damage to keep the brute alive. Phew. Final objective, kill the remaining living bones. Good luck, he's a tanky one. A tip for you, perhaps you can use the push and trap combo. Wah, wah, wah. Uh, yeah, shields only prevent damage from attack. They don't do anything against traps. So there are a couple of traps here. One here, one here. Bear traps, they do three damage to anyone who enters into these squares will take that much damage. Um, so yeah, maybe we can do that. Here's the problem. On your turn, oh, it's not discard two, it's burn two discarded. Oh, burn one from your hand or, or burn two discarded. You're right, thank you. Um, on your turn, you have to select exactly two cards exactly two cards we only have one card in our hand we have a spare dagger we have the option of taking a long rest option long rest is you well it does what you say on the card um you choose one of your discarded cards to burn but then you recover all of your other discarded cards so i have three burn or three discarded cards i could choose to burn one i'd bring the other two back to my hand which is good i would also heal two hit points 
which is great. And I would refresh all of my spent item cards. The problem is, um, this guy's going to murder me. First of all, the heal two only happens at the long rest action, which is a 99 initiative, which is not good. Um, so we can't do that. What we're going to do instead is a short rest. By doing a short rest, one of our discarded cards at random gets burned, but we recover all the others. The short rest also doesn't consume our whole turn. Long rest is your whole turn is consumed to do this. With a short rest, I'm going to do this. We're going to lose one card at random. We're going to lose shield bash over here. And I'm going to say, okay, that's going to be fine. So this thing is now burned. We don't get that back. But we get back our warding strength and our trample. Now, what's interesting about Warding Strength is the top part of this is indeed a push. It's an attack that deals three damage and pushes the target back two squares. So for example, maybe this square and this square, which seems like a pretty good idea. So I'm gonna go and take Warding Strength here. And I'm planning on playing the top of this. Now, Warding Strength by itself should get a kill for us. I shouldn't need to do anything else as long as I use the top of this card. So what I'm gonna do for my second action, for my second card is I think I'm gonna pick Spare Dagger. So we go on initiative 27, because we're hoping to beat the skeleton. Hopefully this is the right pick and I'm not missing anything um, too too obvious. Uh, I mean, we can do some damage of Trample and stuff, but I, as far as I know, Warding Strength at the top of this should just win. So I selected Spare Dagger. I'm making sure I'm running on the 27 uh, initiative. I shouldn't even have to use Spare Dagger itself. Warding Strength should just win. Fingers crossed that I didn't screw anything up. There's our selection, Living Bones Elite. Okay, he's going at a 45, which is good. Uh, on his turn, if he were to get a turn, he would move up to four um, to get into melee with someone, and then he will do a two strength attack on three different targets. Thing is, if we've done everything right, he won't even get his action. So we'll hit there. So on our turn, we're gonna use Warding Strength. We're gonna target him. So it's going to attempt to hit him for three damage, except he's shielded, so he's only gonna take two. Bam, which is what happened. But now we can do the push part. So you can push him any tiles away from you. I'm gonna say, how about we push him here through both traps? He's got four hitch points left. The traps will do three and he doesn't get to shield those. So you should take three and another three and die. Confirm push, bam, bam, bam. Not too shabby, right? Uh, and then for the dagger, oh right, I have to finish my turn. Tell you what, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna do a move. I'm just gonna use the bottom part of the dagger as a generic move. I'm gonna move on to some treasure over here and collect the two gold. Oh, we can skip the rest of the movement and end his turn. Boom. There you go. If you end your turn standing on treasure, you get to collect it, which is gonna be real important later on. Save the brute yet again. I think saving the brute was part of the actual tutorial. Uh, here he's decided that adventuring alone is not working out for him, so he's agreed to be the first mercenary in your guild. Let's get out of the dusty script and see who uh, who else we can recruit. Awesome. The next mission is also going to be sort of this puzzly semi-tutorial um, configuration here. So we've now unlocked the brute. The brute can sure so can sure can soak up damage well, but he's not the most mobile. Having Ampa funds is going to be of utmost importance getting the guild off the ground. Do you know anyone good at, um, gold acquisition? I know just the woman. She's a dab hand at poking holes in those who get in her way. She's in the process of liberating some gold right now. Shall we lend her a hand? So, a blade in the night is our next mission. And then after this, I think we get a, uh, a, a much more sort of standard mission. Trainer points in the direction of a ruined crypt on the outside of town. Dead bandits littered the area, many with knives still embedded in their corpses. It's clear they didn't see their attacker coming. Enter dungeon. Dun, 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 dun. Uh, what was the, uh, qu it looks like there was a good question here. Um, is there any reason why someone would not pick the lowest number initiative? If not, I wonder why they even have the option to pick, not just auto select the two. So there totally is, and um, um, MHLZ, uh, answer the question. Sometimes you want to set up combos with other players, then ordering becomes important. So, um, which is going to be something really easy to coordinate when you're playing on your own. In real life, when you're playing, well, when you're playing either co-op multiplayer here or in the real life board game. Uh, so here, you're going to want to be, you know, be on Discord, be on voice chat kind of thing, and then be like, okay, um, I have a really good move, but only if you know, someone pushes this person or first or, or something like that. So you're going to want to intentionally sometimes delay your initiative so one of the other players can go first. Or 